maybe. Okay, now we're being recorded. Okay, so everything that happened before now didn't matter. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so one of the things, uh, as I said, this is just the breakdown. And just to give you a warning that about an hour in, um, it'll, we're gonna go into breakout. So after uh, Tiffany, Christy, and Rose sort of share, uh, we're gonna ask you to actually go into groups. Uh, there'll be about five or six people. And what we'd like you to do is just share with each other in that small group, like what, what interests you about maybe doing some family history? Like, is there something, someone specific or something about your you know, family or your community or your neighbor? Is there something that brought you in here today that specifically that you'd be, or that you've always thought, oh, I'd love to get, you know, this person, your grandmother or your uncle or some, is there someone that you were thinking in and had in mind? And then even more importantly, what's, what are the challenges? What's standing in your way? You know, is it that, well, you, you would do it, but uh, you don't know, technically you're, you're, uh, you're not sure how to go about it. Or is it language skill? You know, you don't have the language, like uh, the, your grandmother speaks Chinese and you don't speak any Chinese. Or, or maybe there's a lot of materials that you know are there uh, and they're written in another language, you know, Korean or Japanese or, you know, Romanian and you don't, you can't read it. Like what are the challenges that are standing in your way? And, and to share that in that the breakout group. And then when pe we get back together, um, we're going to have a listen and see, you know, what are the things that are standing in people's ways? And the reason why, just to be totally transparent and, and frank, is that so that we at PCHC, we can think about, oh, we didn't realize that one of the, one of the things that are standing in people's way is they, they don't know how to do, use government records to, to look at, uh, you, know, uh, you know, intake uh, records and things like that for, for migration uh, into Canada. And, and, and actually, maybe we can help provide some of that support in future workshops. So, so think of this as also a bit of a focus group to understand the needs that people have in, and what's blocking them or making it difficult. Um, so, and we're gonna have a discussion about that uh, in that last uh, hour, uh, 45 minutes actually, or half an hour after the breakout rooms get back together. And then at the end of the two hours, just to give you another heads up, if, you, if you'd like to stick around, we're gonna, uh, we're going to actually have um, Sophie, who um, just a, a show, shout out, Sophie is, is, is uh, actually um, watching the chats and things right now for questions. And so if you have any difficulties or you want to ask something, feel free to hit the chat. For those who are not familiar with Zoom, underneath you, there's a row of, of, of little buttons and uh, you can see one that says chat. If you hit that, a little window will come up and you can type in you know, a question. And Sophie's just going to be monitoring that. Um, and if, and, you know, she'll, if there's a question that needs to be answered right away, she'll, she'll interrupt me and that's fine. Uh, and sort of ask. Um, and so she'll also at the, uh, you know, from the post two hours, you know, the workshop will be ended. Uh, and, but you can stay around because she'll actually uh, help uh, you think about how to actually upload and share a finished product if you decide uh, that you wanted to make you know, some of the things that we're talking about today. So just that. So this is actually, um, I know it's this image, it's, it's actually uh, a, a short film that was made um, over actually by now about 12, 13 years ago by one of my students in a class, um, Leanne Riding. And you know, a lot of our students, they do interviews with each other as a way to train. So we pair them up uh, before they go and interview other people, they, we pair them up into pairs and they interview each other. And, and she produced this uh, about uh, Andy Mori uh, talking about her, his father. And in fact, um, I'm going to show you a little bit of it just because it's, it's online at this um, YouTube. So uh, this PD, uh, we're going to share this as a PDF for all of you. Um, Sophie can send it around to all of you. So uh, don't worry if, uh, if you, if I, you know, you, we're not going to watch all of these uh, videos that I'm sharing with just little bits, but if you want to watch the whole thing, uh, you'll have the links and stuff afterwards. But I want to show you this because Leanne Riding helped invent what we now call a photo album interviews or photo album history. It's an approach, and that's the one I'm going to actually share you with you today. Um, oops. So this, uh, uh, okay, hang on. Yeah, I have to go to the original to, uh, to actually play it. Um, on, okay. Hmm. 
Okay, so one of the one of the things just to tell you about this approach was it she um, interviewed someone and what it was was she was trying to um, get you know her uh, Andy to just talk about someone who actually had passed away. So it wasn't even an interview with someone who was still around to be interviewed. She was actually asking someone to share a story about someone, that, their father, who was actually um, no longer alive. And so when you think about who it is that you want to take on as a subject, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who is still um, able to talk to you. It may be that you talk, let's say it's your a, a grandfather or someone, uh, but they've passed away. You could actually talk to, you know, his children or people who knew him, um, or maybe you, you know, your mother who was who, who was a child and grew up knowing uh, him. And and so one of the first things I'd say is you can have an interview subject who's not alive, and you can use things like a photo album uh, to to talk about that person and to um, have someone share stories or multiple people. And one of the interesting things about that is that when multiple people talk about the same person, you'll often discover this complex human being because different people knew that person differently. So someone, even different siblings might know a father very differently because the oldest child had a very different relationship than the youngest child. Or um, you know, a mother and daughter have a very different relationship than a mother and a son. So when you talk to uh, a daughter, about their mother, it's a very different kind of relationship and you get a different aspect of that person. So one of the things about a photo album um, and a photo album approach is you can A, talk about someone who's no longer with you. Uh, you could also do that even with someone who is still around. Um, you know, it's an, a, again, an approach where you can use the photos, you know, old family photos to spur stories, like who's in those photos? Um, oh, what was that person like? Um, oh, you, you, this picture is uh, taken somewhere. Oh, uh, do you remember that? It actually makes it easier for people to remember when they see the photos. It also makes it easier for you as a questioner or an in as an interviewer to come up with interesting questions. So you can, you know, chase what's in the photo. Um, one of the things we often ask people to do is to actually um, go through their photo albums and find, you know, 10 photos. So instead of bringing the whole album, ask them to, you know, pull out 10 or to pick 10 that you will talk about. And that ends up help, helping again, the person you want to talk to go through a lot of a whole photo album and choose and to in, in some sense begin to already be prepared for say a conversation or a, uh, an interview. It's, uh, it's like a mnemonic device. It helps spur people's memories. Okay. So this one, if you, um, and I encourage you to go see it afterwards uh, because I'm, I'm having actually trouble um, uh, sharing the screen uh, because of the bandwidth issues. Uh, but Andy Mori, just to tell you what Leanne Riding did was, um, she, she just used, and when you watch it, you'll see that it's low resolution. It was shot, you know, in uh, 2000, I think five. And at that time, the cameras were terrible. Um, and it's all sort of like bur blurry and pixelated. But still, because what she did was she just shot Andy talking about his dad while flipping through a photo album and talking about each photo and a trip they took because uh, his father, Andy's father had been interned, uh, Japanese Canadian, had been interned and as a child uh, in camp, basically in the interior, uh, his father took, went on a trip with Andy. Um, so this was before he passed away, Joseph Mori, and uh, they went on a road trip in a car and his father shared where he used to play. So it, it, the film's called Dad's Playground because it was about Andy describing his dad's memories of his childhood in an internment camp uh, in the ninth, you know, after 1942. So I, I won't spoil the ending, so to speak, uh, and tell you the whole story, but um, what it is, it's 
it, it, it actually, for me as a, a teacher and for a lot of the students in that class, it, it actually created a, a, an approach, like exactly what I've been describing to you, which is to use photos and photo albums as a way to tell story. And the reason why I, I kind of am suggesting this uh, for you to think about is, as I said, is to, is to not to tell you all the different ways you can approach a, a family history, but to, to kind of drill down on this one approach, um, and, and I'm starting with uh, Leanne's sort of um, invention of it, so to speak, 15 years ago, and why it is that we find it so useful. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of go back to sharing screen and, and show you um, the other times when we've, we've used it. Um, one of the things that we find so powerful about this approach is that it, it actually um, encourages people to, to tell stories. So on this end of the interview end, it, it really is effective. It shapes the stories. So if you're asking someone to choose 10 stories or 10 photos, you're also choosing 10 stories. Um, and so you get that person to already curate their life. We tend to take photos of important moments with important people that we care about. So what's in the photos, who's in the photos is often also a part of the curation of the memory. Um, and if you think about it, family albums are full of like birthday parties. They're full of like moments like trips or uh, being in, or gatherings when you know, large numbers of people get together. Or, and so what are th the kinds of things that are gonna be in a photo is also gonna shape the storytelling. So the next, uh, just to show you very quickly, and again, you can, um, this is Elder Larry Grant of Musqueam. Some of you may know uh, what for him. Um, one of the really uh, interesting things for me is how in adopting that kind of the, um, uh, so I, I, someone out there maybe, um, it may not have muted your microphone. So if if um, if you haven't muted your microphone, um, please go ahead and hit mute. It's down in the bottom left of your screen. Um, just it sounds like we're picking up some um, some background noise from. from some microphone. So this is uh, there you go. So I'm just gonna. So I'm just gonna play this for a second. So you can see that, you know, this is actually in my living room. So it's not the greatest uh, site for an interview, but we just asked Larry to actually choose photos from his photo album. Life story. My dad came over from China, probably around 1920. He was born around 1906. And he was in his teens when he came over. And our mother's born the same year, 1906. And uh, when dad was used to be working on the farm, he would see this lady, this young woman walking by all the time, and notice that she was never less than a male companion. So uh, uh, one, I guess one year he made up his mind to go find out about her. And he came down to our grand. Okay, so I'm actually going to pause there. Um, and, and if you're interested in the rest of that story, um, I encourage you to um, to go, you know, look it up online. Um, but notice a couple of things. One is 
um, having the person who you're interviewing introduce themselves and who they are. Um, in that moment, it was actually um, near uh, Larry's house down to Musqueam Reserve Number Two, um, and you know his names. You know so the three different names uh, that that he you know his Hunkaminum or Musqueam name, the, the Chinese name, you know the English name. Um, and then him going through the photos. So one of the things about the photos is, as I mentioned, it allows you to have something for the person to talk about very specifically to about the important people in their lives. Um, but it also means that you can scan the photos using uh, almost all printers now uh, have also a scanning function and then use those later if you were to edit that into a short, you know, and this one's actually only about four and a half minutes. Uh, we interviewed Larry for over um, three hours and made a series of small shorts that reach about three to five minutes. Um, and those were actually important because we could then share them back and then Larry can share them with his grandkids and other people. Um, so this idea of having a short um, version that's, that's shareable online and then those photos that he's talking about and holding in his hand or they're on the table in front um, can then become part of how you edit it so that as he's talking about a photo, it can be in, on the screen. And this can be done now um, fairly easily with, um, with editing software like iMovie and um, that, that, are, that are, is just on every phone. You know, any iPhone has iMovie on there. If you have an Android phone, there's also these apps that can do that. If you have a laptop, there are ways in which you can use, again, iMovie and other simple video editing um, you can also use, and we'll talk about it at the end, uh, PowerPoint. You can do a slideshow of just those photos. You can scan them or take a picture of them and then just put them in a PowerPoint slideshow and then talk about or have the audio if you've interviewed someone and then you can time the slideshow, the video with the audio, right? So show each photo when it's relevant and uh, well, with the audio of the person speaking. Uh, this, uh, I just want to show this clip um, this is actually done, you can see the site or the settings the same, it's in my living room. And this is uh, Mrs. Yi, um, uh, Fong Yi, who was talking about her childhood growing up in a, you know, in a village in rural China. Um, and uh, just to, just to uh, uh, full caveat, the reason why uh, some of the stories um, I'm showing are Chinese is not particularly because I'm I, I only do uh, research on Chinese Canadians, but because uh, some of these are examples are from Chinese Canadian stories, uh, which is um, a, a uh, project that uh, uh, was done in 2012 as part of um, uh, a legacy of the federal apology for Canada's uh, history of anti-Chinese legislation. And uh, Chinese Canadian stories was a, a project that involved three uh, universities, SFU, us, and um, uh, UVic, as well as 29 different community orgs across Canada, and we, we did a lot of story gathering. And so uh, the examples I'm using are drawn from there. Um, actually, Denise Fong, who is, uh, who is actually on, on the audience right now, was the project manager for that. And Denise right now is the um, co-curator of A Seat at the Table, which is an upcoming exhibit that's going to open in uh, the Hong Sing Athletic Club building in Chinatown about Chinese-Canadian immigration uh, in BC. And so I'm really proud that Denise is here and had a hand in all of these that I'm showing you. But that's why uh, some of these examples are Chinese Canadian uh, because of, you know, of the projects that uh, they came out of. But this is just one, um, again, you can notice the same music. Use of music is another, you don't have to, but again, because the software now it makes it possible to actually um, edit and use music to set a tone, it's another suggestion I would make is if you're trying to turn a story you you gathered during a discussion into a short clip. Here's an example of how the music really does some work. You can see, you know this zooming in on the photo? That actually is called uh, the Ken Burns effect. And it's actually quite um, easy to to use in iMovie. It's actually called the Ken Burns effect in iMovie. And all it is is to take a still photo and then zoom in on it. So this story is actually quite poignant because she's talking about what it was like, you know, as an eight-year-old child when her father, who she had never met before, 
Um, he had left before she was born. Um, and when he first came back to the village and she met her father for the first time. Um, so one of the things that, you know, may be in the way, an obstacle for many of you is, is our language um, uh, loss. Is that growing up in Canada, going to school in Canada, um, you may not have the same language capability as uh, an elder's first language. Um, and so I showed this because it's one of the things that, you know, may be something that is holding some of you back from so perhaps doing an interview with a, with a grandparent or, or someone who's older or, you, or looking at their letters or, or something, which if you only had uh, an access, and it is one of the, the, the kind of uh, legacies, you could say, of uh, English dominance as part of the kind of colonial history of, of British Columbia, is that rather than encouraging people to be able to speak multiple languages, we we reduce people to only be able to speak English through education. So often if you're born here, like I was, uh, by the time you're 18, you're functionally monolingual or, or only having a, a little bit of home language. Whereas actually in many other parts of the world, multilingualism is normal. Um, so again, I showed that as how someone who is expressing themselves in their native mother tongue, the thing that they were taught to, to them, you know, we use that term mother tongue to refer to a language that someone's familiar with because it was their home language, the one that their mother literally you know, spoke with them when they were children. We feel much more comfortable speaking in the language, even if we are able to speak English. If English was the second or third language that we learned, often we're not as expressive, we're not able to show our emotions and not able to actually talk about complicated abstract subjects in a second language. Um, and so interviewing in an original language uh, of the speaker, uh, one that they feel comfortable in is, is, is something that I'd say is, uh, you know, is one of the, uh, we can strive for it as, as a, one of the better ways to get you know, good storytelling and sharing. Um, this I just wanted to share because it's a much more polished version of that photo album history. Very similar, this is Senator Lillian Dick, uh, Canadian um, Senator uh, from Saskatchewan. Um, she grew up in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. Her mother was Cree and her father was a Chinese um, restaurant, Chinese cafe owner. And her mother's sister married her father's brother. So literally two, two brothers marrying two sisters. And so you can see again that there's the use of these photos you know, we, just like with Elder Larry Grant, just like with Mrs. Fong Yi, and just like with, um, with actually Anne Riding and Andy Mori, we, this is, you see, you can, she's sitting in front of a table with some photos, and we just have the camera on and ask her to tell the story of who's in the photos and, and her life through those photos. So I'm, again, I, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna show the whole clip, but you can uh, for sure see that clip online if you follow the links. Um, and I, again, what, one of the things, if you do, I, I would encourage you to go watch each of these because one of the things about how we edited her story. So again, that interview was almost two hours sitting there as she told, the, you know, but then online, the version that you can go see on YouTube is actually quite short, only five, you know, those shorts are about five minutes to seven minutes at the most. Um, when we were editing uh, these, these uh, shorts, uh, these interviews into shorts to share online, we, we had, we kept ourselves to what we call the YouTube then. It used to be that YouTube had a limit on the length of a video that you could upload because of all kinds of issues about maximum bandwidth and all that. And actually that limit was quite useful because it was short enough. Unlike now, YouTube videos can be hours long and um, that, that YouTube limit, you know, it was around seven uh, to eight minutes. It was actually a perfect length for telling a story um, in a concise way, but still long enough that you could actually, you know, uh, get a lot across. And, and when you watch those, I, I'd like you to, 
actually watch them to see how the story is edited. As I said, the original is about two hours long in order to kind of get across some key aspects of that person's life. And, and it's one of the ways I would uh, encourage as again, what photo album history does is it creates a concise order of what is a person's life according to their own interpretation of themselves. And so what comes across is something that is an essence, you could say, of that person. And as if you're editing someone else's story, you know, that two hours may be a lot of essence, a lot of photos, a lot of different stories, but how do you kind of then create something that is sh can be shared and watched by others without watching the full two hours, let's say, or the full three or five hours or, or 15 hours over three days because you did a lot of conversation. Um, that, those are two different aspects of, a, of this process of doing family history. And so one of the things that watching, say, the Senator Lillian Ditt story is, um, it, we ended up editing uh, this, this short of around her voyage or trip to her father's ancestral village in China. And how that ended up being a kind of moment of self uh, discovery and how self exploration and, and how she shared it with one of her sons. And it ended up being a very poignant, as, as I hopefully you'll, you'll realize when you watch it, a very poignant sort of um, story of, of who she was. And um, I think one of the things uh, I always tell my students, and you know, Tiffany and Christy can confirm this, or Tiffany, Christy, and Rose can confirm this, I always say, it takes a really good writer to write a story so well that you can move someone to tears. It doesn't take that good a film editor to edit a short to actually be moving, you know, and move someone to tears. And so uh, I, want, I want you to think about that when you watch um, Senator Lillian Dick's story, is that, you know, these shorts were edited actually by students and by, you know, um, you know as with Tiffany and Rose and uh, Christy, when they come on, it's edited by someone who may, you know, if they had had to write this as a three page short story or a poem, they may not have been able to move you with their writing, but in using sort of film editing, uh, the kind of technology now that every smartphone and every laptop has, they're still able to do something that hopefully you'll find actually emotionally very effective. So I'm going to end in now on, you know, in my half 30 minute um, um, kind of sharing with uh, something that my eight year old did. And the reason why I'm doing this is not because I'm bragging about my eight year old. I'm saying that my eight year old can do this. So if you think everything I've shown you before seems way too difficult and wow, I don't know. Yeah, it's good for him to say it and good for him to talk about UBC students being able to do it, but that's not me. This is my eight year old did this. And so um, it's a way of saying if my eight year old can do it, you can do it. Um, and my eight year old did this uh, because at school they just said, oh, you know, share something about your, your people in your families. What's their most special belonging, you know, what, what means something to them. And so this is done basically with photos and iMovie. So plopping I, photos into iMovie using this thing called, that I mentioned, the Ken Burns effect, to, so that it wasn't just the photo sitting there, but uh, you can use iMovie to make it seem like the photo is being zoomed in on and things like that. But um, we, she recorded us talking about whatever this object was, and then, you know, she basically used that very basic iMovie interface that an eight-year-old can figure out on an iPad, and she made this. So uh, for those who are uh, actually, <laughs> I will admit that for those who are maybe older um, and not as familiar as, as eight-year-olds now are with swipe, swiping iPad screens and stuff, it may be more challenging than it was for, for Michi, but um, still, it, it does show that the, the technology has made it much easier. You know, 40 years ago, doing something even like this would have cost thousands of dollars because the equipment and the editing, uh, all this kind of stuff, um, cutting film and, and, and turning it into uh, a short. But I'm just going to play this so you get a sense. And I'll play this full because it's, it's, it's a little longer, but also you'll get the sense of it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, thorough. 
like everything about our family or our belongings. It, it just needs to be a little bit of storytelling. Oh. Oops, what happened? Okay, sorry, technical difficulties. Okay, let's try that again. Henry, um, we're not getting any of the sound. Oh. Henry, I don't think anyone can hear you right now. Um, the sound doesn't seem to be working. I think he's trying to work on starting it over. Um, Tiffany, could you perhaps start it? I think Henry's got some issues at his end. It might also be, you know, his Wi-Fi is sometimes mm -hmm. slow. Yeah, so absolutely. Just... Yeah, sure. Um, if it's okay with Henry, I will uh, get started on our presentation. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tiffany and um, some of my fellow presenters today are Rose and Christy. So like Henry said, we're students of his. Uh, we took his class on Asian migration to the Americas in the spring, which got cut short, unfortunately, due to COVID. And then uh, we were supposed to go on a global seminar with him to China, um, Taiwan and Malaysia this summer, but that also got cut short. But luckily we were still able to participate in a virtual global seminar. Um, over the past two months. So like Henry mentioned, we're also doing some storytelling for an upcoming Game of Vancouver exhibit with uh, Nick Spong, who is also here. Um, and he asked us to speak a little bit about some of the experiences that we've had in terms of our uh, storytelling experiences and filming videos, interviews, and things like that. So I'm just gonna quickly present some of our research findings from our most recent project which was on social media as a means of sharing intangible heritage. 
So one of our findings is that youth are actively engaged in intergenerational storytelling. Uh, I'm just going to share um, this slide here, which is subtle Asian traits. Uh, subtle Asian traits is an example of how some youth are engaging in super low tech ways. The intergenerational storytelling uh, Asian for the youth who might not have heard of it. It's Australia who decided to start a Facebook group called Subtle Asian Traits. And now there are 1.8 million users on Facebook who are in this one group. I would be shocked if there is another Facebook group that is larger than this group. Um, but essentially in this group, they are podiums, interesting videos and pictures. Um, and as you can see on the slide, they are also sharing family history. Um, so these are all posts that are being crowdsourced from Facebook users. And all of these posts are connected to youth being interested in their identity as overseas Asians, um, as this group is generally um, most popular with Asian, with Asian Canadians, Asian Americans, and Asian Australians. So in the posts that you can see on this slide, um, there's this post right here. Um, these members posted pictures of their grandparents and talk about their story. Um, so these posts are fairly interesting because a lot of people resonate with them. Um, it might be a little bit small on your screens, but in this post, um, 41,000 likes were reached um, for this simple picture of their grandparents and just a little bit of stories about um, their grandparents. So lots of people have been commenting and responding back with similar stories of their parents and grandparents. And it's been a space for youth to discuss some of the challenges that their families have faced, such as um, many Cambodian and Vietnamese youth talking about um, their parents' resilience as refugees. So this is a su super simple way that um, some youth have been engaged in storytelling. I'm going to pass it off to Christy now to chat a little bit about intergenerational interviewing. Mm, so we just have some just quick tips here for just inter intergenerational um, interviewing. And I think uh, one of our number one uh, tips is just be their friend. Um, people of different generations um, might be hard at first, but if you get over the um, first, like the first barrier of the generational differences, everyone can be friends. So just like kind of introducing yourself and setting up the interview in a very like friendly manner. So it's kind of like, as if um, like bringing back to when we were in a childhood and like being curious about our grandparents and like kind of asking them questions all the time, like why this, why that? And like having that more um, intimate like connection is really important. Um, so that just helps to make them feel comfortable and especially in sharing very personal stories with you. And then um, also keeping in mind when you're being that friend and being someone that they can talk to, don't be afraid to share your own stories with them because um, interviews, um, they might seem like a one way thing, but they certainly aren't. Make sure it's like a two way conversation. And so while you want them to share their stories, you also want to share personal things about yourself. And then um, we have, like Kenry talked about the language barrier, and um, we would recommend bringing in a translator or even better, a family friend, or um, if you have any friends or they have any friends that can help be the translator. And that'd be very helpful because um, sometimes the language barrier is difficult to work with, but then also don't let that limit you when you do the interview, because if there is a language barrier, it might set up the interview um, so that you have to think, you're like forced to think of a more creative way of bringing out the story. So don't let the language um, limit you if you can't find any translators or any other resources to help you with that. And then lastly is just to be transparent. So this one is, we're mostly um, talking about the interview questions and um, you can always send the questions ahead of time. Um, or at least the outline of it. You don't have to send everything, but um, just in our experience, sending some of the outline questions ahead of time helps put them in a spot where they're not just trying to think of things right on the spot. So it helps them prepare for the interview and also makes them feel more relaxed and like comfortable in just sharing the stories. And in sending them the questions ahead of time, um, they also have time to prepare any photos or anything that Henry talked about that can be very helpful for the storytelling process. So they can bring their own photos and you can just have a um, connection there and be able to ask them like, oh, what happened in this photo and what happened here? Yeah, so those are our three very quick tips for intergenerational um, interviewing. And then I think next, 
Yeah, so Henry mentioned the project where we had to do a quick interview with someone in our class. And this is the one that I did for the history class. And it was with Lily Ng, which um, I, I went into class and she was just sitting, I sat in the seat next to her. And so when Henry mentioned this um, project, I was very interesting, interested in her because everyone else in the class was just like university student ages. So when I saw Lily, I was, off the bat, I was really interested and she was right beside me. So um, we just turned to each other and we're kind of like, oh, should we do this on, do this project with each other? And um, she was really happy to um, do this with me. And I think uh, Tiffany will, will show a little bit of the video. So on this Saturday morning after Lily's Cantonese class, we decided to meet up together for dim sum. And funny enough, we actually like the exact same dishes, the very typical food that CBCs would order. And yeah, so after dim sum, we walked around Chinatown where she told me about her stories growing up there and showed me all the buildings that were significant to her as a child yeah, growing so up in Vancouver. The video, but um, we decided to get dim sum, which wasn't really plan to be in the final um final project um but we decided to get dim sum because food is also always a great way to kind of like get to know the other person um so we shared a meal together so i got to listen to her story and she listened to mine and that really helped frame how i wanted to plan the rest of the video and through eating together we found out that despite the generational difference uh we had a lot of things in common like we were both born and raised in Vancouver, um, and then just like growing up here, like going to Chinese school in Chinatown, and just a lot of um, experiences were similar despite the age difference. Um, and then now I'll share a little bit about the rest of the video, which is formatted as a Q&A session. And today we have a box of questions and just topics that we're gonna go over together and ask each other. And yeah, so do you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, what are your Chinatown connections? Okay. Uh, so yeah, we talked about a bit, like a bit about this before, but we both have some connections with Chinatown. So for me, I grew up going to Chinese school in Chinatown. My dad worked there at Garlene Pharmacy, and both my grandparents were Chinese doctors um, at. Um, I forgot the name of the place, but it's gone now, so they don't have it anymore. But yeah, both my parents, I mean, my grandparents were Chinese doctors in Chinatown when I was a kid growing up. Wow, that's interesting. Well, in my case, I lived near Chinatown, and I grew up in Chinatown. And uh, my dad was uh, once the president of our Chinese Benevolent Association, and my mom worked as a servant for the Yip family, and uh, went to Chinese school there. Yeah, so this is the Q&A session um, and it, it was just really interesting because we never really wanted to focus the questions on the generation difference, but um, having both of us there and just answering more general questions actually helped to show audiences instead the differences between our experiences. And yeah, so I think in that it was just kind of like how Henry mentioned keeping it simple. Sometimes you don't have to ask the super, super like detailed or like deep questions, sometimes making it simple can actually help draw out those experiences um, even better. And yeah, now we're gonna pass it on to um, talking about um, filming techniques and like narratives. Um, so some of the questions we were asked to address um, about filmmaking were, number one, um, how do you use film or technology to present a compelling narrative? So while the story is the focus of the piece, elements such as B-roll of objects or surrounding environments can help piece together the story and help viewers visualize things. So for example, this GIF um, on the slide is B-roll that Tiffany took of me walking outside of uh, the restaurant establishment that we were going to make a film on for Henry's class. And so that just kind of establishes the setting before we dive into the interview. Um, additionally, you could add music to set the tone or mood, um, as Henry previously mentioned. 
Um, but one thing to be careful about is to make sure the music does not overpower the speaking portions. And another element to add is pictures. So pictures help visualize certain parts of the story. And this is especially handy if you're presenting um, a story that has elements of flashback in it. Uh, and then next we'll be sharing some resources for beginner filmmakers. So there's a ton of ways that you can engage with storytelling that are simple and low cost. So our first suggestion is to use your smartphone. So a lot of phones nowadays have really good cameras. Um, a lot of them can actually shoot in 4K video and have built-in stabilizers that make it look smooth and professional. And you can also like buy really cheap accessories to make a setup. So for example, I don't know if you can see my video, but I have a tripod and a phone mount. So this is really easy to like uh, film things if you want like a static um, frame or if you wanna like just hold it and move it around, it's really easy for stabilizing. Um, in terms of editing, most computers come with basic editing software. So I think Mac computers come with iMovie and some older Windows computers have Windows Movie Maker, um, but there are also like more professional programs that you can purchase. Um, and also as Henry previously mentioned, there are editing apps that you can get for your phone or tablet as well. Um, additionally, if you're feeling adventurous, there are social media platforms such as Snapchat or TikTok through which you can create videos and they have built-in editing software. Um, uh, additionally, for projects that, like, if you're not doing a film, so maybe if you're just doing interviews to write a blog post or something, um, we'd recommend doing audio recording. Uh, because this can help you piece together parts of the narrative that you might have forgotten throughout the interview or might have gotten jumbled. And audio recordings can be really easily transcribed using online tools such as there's one called otter.ai where you just upload the audio file and it automatically transcribes it for you. And if you do like audio recording, it can help you not be too focused on taking notes and so you can keep your full attention on the conversation. And lastly, we'll be talking about some challenges that we've experienced and some tips on overcoming them. Um, so the first one is that the interviewee might not feel comfortable right away. So while it's good to be prepared, sometimes it's easier to throw away the script. Um, and by knowing your questions and goals ahead of time, you can have a really casual conversation with them, which will make them feel more comfortable. And it will also help you as the interviewer to be more present and curious about and to ask like follow up questions and help the overall flow of the conversation. Um, the second thing is to not make assumptions about how the story will go. So sometimes, especially if you're writing like a script ahead of time, um, in you sometimes the questions that you come up with, you might think that they are very significant or will elicit some kind of interesting discussion, but sometimes that actually leads you to a dead end. So our tip is to always have a variety of questions up your sleeve and to practice active listening so that you can easily improvise questions on the spot. And another tip is to think of other ways to rephrase the question or repeat the question in a different way. So this is useful because sometimes the interviewee doesn't initially understand the question but might not be comfortable to ask you to repeat it or rephrase it, or they might just need more time to think about it. So this usually just gives them an opportunity to have more time to craft an answer. Um, another challenge is that during the interview, parts of the story might be broken up and might not be in like chronological order. So as an interviewer, you can, like a verbal trick you can do is to sometimes summarize what the interviewee has said and repeat it back to them just to make sure that everything is clear and you're understanding everything fully. And additionally, if you run into this problem, like say you're making a film, um, don't worry because everything can be fixed in the editing stage. So you can cut, cut the interview and arrange it in a way that the story is more coherent and piece things together so it flows better and makes more sense for the audience. Mm -hmm. So that's it from us today. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, the three of us are still learning a lot ourselves as we're still going through this process. Um, 
and continuing to learn about it throughout the summer as we're doing internships with Henry and um, St. John's College and Burnaby Village Museum. So i um, going to pass it over to Henry now um, if he's around or also happy to answer um, any questions if necessary. Thanks so much, Tiffany and Christy and Rose. Thanks both for like saving me from technical difficulties um, and stepping in. Actually, it was a, we were about 30 seconds away from you stepping in anyway. So thanks so much for, uh, I, my, my apologies to everyone else. I think um, I actually had to relaunch Zoom um, and leave and start it again. So there was some technical difficulties that uh, had to do with Zoom as a program. So my apologies for that. But um, that is actually, uh, I really wanted, um, you know, Tiffany and Christy and Rose to come in precisely as you saw, because, um, you know, they're, they really worked at, you know, the best ways that they could figure out. Uh, they've been very creative, uh, you know, in interviewing and in sort of how to storytell. Um, they've already, uh, especially Tiffany and Christy, um, you know, the last couple months have already been uh, working with our larger team on editing um, interviews that have been done. Um, so I think Christy was just uh, working on the um, Sunrise Tofu. Um, so Peter Joe and the, the Joe, Leslie Joe and the Joe family. And so that's going to actually be appearing in the, in the uh, A Seat at the Table exhibit. Um, so that's it's another way of, of sort of making, of lowering that bar. Like if you say, I want to talk about I want to hear all about your life and your childhood and everything like that. If you know, some people have had tough, tough, you know, uh, childhood. So if they're if they lived through war or civil war or or you know conflict, if they're refugees, um, it may be very. Um, what's the word? Threatening. I think is not a not a you know too hard a word to use if for someone to ask. You know, I want you to talk again about maybe traumatic times or reliving things uh so yeah very much so i think that's part of the ethics of conversations is what you know respecting what the other person's um you know willing to share but um i don't know if any other others uh, did you guys come to a solution you know <laughs> did one did you, did you figure out that problem I, and i don't know whether anyone else uh in the in the uh, 30 odd folks overall has um has any thoughts about this. I, I, the example that I would use was, um, you know, when I, I showed you a little bit of Elder Larry Grant, um, when, when he agreed to actually share a story, um, it was really a big, you know, I'd known him for a, a few years before that, but really through him giving welcomes and us talking, um, you know, but his decision to actually share his story um, was was a, a, a an act of generosity on his part, and because it was something we had talked about the the need to sort of have someone share some of these so that people you know, um, know about it and uh, and and really changed the way that they saw things. And I think he saw it as an obligation or responsibility on his part to, to share his story, but other, because otherwise people wouldn't know about, you know, this very extensive, not just his family, but about the extensive history of, the, of Chinese and indigenous relations. Um, and, and partly also because his younger brother Howard had shared, but his, because he was younger, he didn't know uh, as much about the traumatic and difficult times. And so again, uh, uh, Larry, uh, who is an, one of our honorary patrons of PCHC, one of the founding uh, patrons uh, and, and board members. Uh, so it's interesting how, again, not to be, uh, please don't be manipulative, but I think sometimes what is the motivation for sharing if it's not just about the person themselves, but a, like, and that's why I think intergenerational grandchildren asking is really different than a, than a son or daughter asking, for instance, right? Son or daughter asking is, is partly to also trigger your own very close relationship with a parent or with someone of that, of that generation. Whereas a grandchild, it's amazing how much more forthcoming someone might be if a grandchild asks versus a child. So uh, another way of thinking about it is who asks and, and therefore what is the 
purpose of sharing. And again, uh, it changes the motivational structure, so to speak, um, sometimes. But thank, thanks for sharing, bringing that back, Pat. It would have been a very interesting conversation to be a part of. Um, Sophie, uh, maybe group, uh, the next group B challenges? Or? So that's um, Stephanie's group. Oh. Um, yeah, we, we had um, a really nice discussion. It was nice to meet in a smaller group. I think I'm going to hand the mic over to both Gwen and Janie who articulated, um, I, I've typed them out already, but maybe they want to expand on what they thought were um, some of the things that they might find uh, a little bit challenging. So Gwen, do you want to uh, speak first? Hi, and thanks for meeting us, Stephanie. It was interesting because I, I felt like my, my father had passed away in 2007 and always wanted to write a book of his kind of humorous, funny stories. And I don't know if, if as a group, we never took him seriously or it was just, yeah, 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 dad, we'll, we look forward to that. And I just see now in hindsight how we could have helped him and could have forwarded the project. And I do have lots of uh, videotapes of him and, you know, pictures and things like that that I could use. I could bring some stories to life, definitely. And now with my mom also wanting to, you know, she's uh, in the senior's home now and she's wanting to recount her travel histories and she's also stuck and stopped. And I felt really inspired by the three young people that you brought to us and how seamlessly and quick and easily they seem to have done it. So I think maybe a, a group or um, whether it be a class or a cohort or something like that and having something that would give us maybe small steps that we could be accountable to and uh, kind of grow together in our ease and ability. And I think it would inspire one another as well in doing that. Yes, my history is, is of Ukrainian heritage, but I feel too like I want to understand their story better than what I have and I think I have one uncle left and one aunt on my dad's side of the family and two aunts other than my mother on my mother's side. And I, I just feel like time is slipping away. So now or never. And Jamie had some other, um, uh, also some very different uh, concerns and maybe Jamie wants to take the mic now. Unless I suppose, did anyone have a response to Gwen's? We can't hear you, Henry, I think it is talking. We can't hear you, Henry. We can't hear you, Henry. Sorry about that, it's uh, technical. Oh, you're gone you're again. You flashed on. Okay, I think what is, uh, there's a lagging in the program and so I push it and then turns on, but it doesn't turn on. So uh, uh, please go ahead, Jamie. And, and, uh, I had a couple of things I was uh, I was thinking, uh, uh, but why don't we um, yeah hear hear yours first and then I'll okay. Um, I think my main uh, thought was just around how how to spark stories from people. So um, how to get people interested and excited to want to engage and tell their stories, um, whether that's on a personal or I'm. Um, I'm partly asking on behalf of our organization is wanting to do a story sharing project. Um, and I've done some of this personally, but I've also noticed that it's sometimes been difficult to get people to engage. So I guess just different avenues of getting people to engage with you. I know a lot of people maybe do better like in person or if you call them on the phone, they might be more willing to engage. Like I've sent out, you know, invitations with prompts before sometimes and not gotten a whole lot of interest, but just a few people who are interested. So yeah, ways to engage, I guess, is my question. So actually, it's, it's, it's uh, thanks for sharing those, uh, both of you, Jamie and, and Gwen and, and, and that group. And it sounds like, sounds like you guys have some very practical things that you've run into that um, are actually quite common, interestingly enough. Um, uh, I, I'll give a version. We had an interview set up with an elder 
Um, and everything was cued. You know, we had the uh, students with, with the camera, microphones, everything. And we, it was supposed to be 10 a.m. on one Sunday. And um, literally at 9.50, as we were outside, just pulling equipment out of the car, we got a telephone call from uh, the person's uh, son saying uh, he, he, he was backing off. He got cold feet. And the reason why was literally not us, but because um, some other the family members wanted to just uh, take part as well, because they were really curious because, you know, this was uh, someone, and even though some of them had heard stories and stuff, but they showed up at the house and that's what spooked the person. And so we had, like I said, we were out in the street and it was called off. Unfortunately, that, that elder um, passed away actually the very next year. And so we, we didn't get anything on the, the family themselves felt horrible because they had really been looking forward to that, that moment. So that feeling of reticence, um, you know, there's a, there's a long list of them. They're everything from, I don't think my story is that interesting. So a kind of, why would, nobody cares. And, and that can actually be a part of a long-term reaction to nobody actually caring. So it, it's, it's sort of almost, someone's convinced that their story's not interesting or it's, it's, it wouldn't be of interest to anyone because no one's actually cared. And so one or two asks often aren't going to actually overcome that, so to speak. Um, it, it, as I said, it often matters also who cares and how persistent that message is to overcome. Um, and not making it so, the mistake we had made actually on that interview was that showing up with all that apparatus was too much too quickly. It, it should have been more conversations over coffee and, uh, and you know, like a softer on-ramp, so to speak. Um, and I think that's one of the things that uh, when Tiffany and Christy and, um, and Rose uh, presented, one of the things that I, I, I tell students is, is just eat with someone for not just one meal, just, just go and eat, you know, the dim sum part. Even if you think everything's smooth, uh, you trust people after a meal and breaking bread, so to speak, in a different way than, than any other. And so I think, uh, again, making sure that you're not jumping to the pressing the record button too early is the way I would put it. You know, have that trust building, have full conversations with no recording devices, you know, other than you taking notes afterwards. Show the interest, you know, you think of it as just, I just need to make sure that this person is convinced that I'm interested, you know, or if you are the person who's the primary interviewer. Um, or, you know, again, enlist some other people that they might be more interested in telling the story to. As I said, younger, you know, now that means you have to make sure that younger person is actually showing interest rather than, you know, looking at their iPhone um, every once in a while. But um, it's one of the reasons why school, school projects, strangely enough, uh, when an elder or someone knows that their, their grandchild's grades depend on them talking to this kid, <laughs> it's suddenly like you're standing in the way of the kid getting an A. Um, you know, not to be facetious, but that's not a bad motivator for someone who is totally convinced that they, their story isn't that interesting, but it's like, okay, well, I'll do it for, for this kid because some stupid teacher somewhere has asked the kid to, to interview some somebody older in the family and it has to be me because you know I'm the only one standing or something but but I think you you've hit on what I think is um is for me the genius of really good interviewers uh, their ability to kind of um you know in a very uh gentle way you know, build trust and lead people to feel that it's a genuine authentic interest and that they're can be willing to share um but going to Gwen's point about, yeah, I, it's interesting that you, your story about sort of the funny stories that, you know, now, if it can be even like through the, through the eyes of the listeners, right? Those who, those who over the, it's almost like, yeah, we're going to compile all the funniest stories through all the people who told those stories, 
too. <laughs> and whether they, what they found funny or which was their favorite story. And That's um, a way to do that it. thing about finding the elephant by all the people touching different parts of the elephant, right? So maybe you won't get that comprehensive com collection of the, but then the greatest hits through other people's eyes. Uh, again, often you, um, one of my favorite is when I was at UCLA, we had a, a, a number of people do a project uh, on again, family members. And again, it was someone who was uh, doing something on about his grandfather who had passed away. And he discovered all this stuff. And in fact, everyone he talked to discovered things about that grandfather, because he really was a mysterious guy. And everybody had a little piece of him, so to speak. But coming together, um, they got a fuller picture. And, and I'll say that you see this at funerals, unfortunately. Because you know, a funeral brings together all the different people that knew someone and have you ever noticed at funerals how as people talk about you go wow i didn't know that you know the work person you know wives are going i didn't know if my husband was at all like this he was funny really you know or it's it's it's, it's interesting how a funeral can bring together all the different perspectives and that's when um you know an approach to even someone who's passed away as i said is is it can be quite effective so hopefully that's a that's some encouragement to those who, um, and then I think the other point about having, um, having something that's a regular workshop. We, uh, I remember uh, the Chinese Canadian Historical Society, who uh, PCHC has worked a lot with over the years, and I'm on the board of, uh, we had a writing workshops where people who aren't writers would just come and write about something, a memory, and it was because it was peers meeting every, you know, two weeks, you know six times, eight times in a row, and everybody kind of felt this. It's like uh, jogging in the morning or exercise, you know, together. It's like you, you go and if you, it motivates you, like you said, structures and disciplines it and, and pushes you to actually get something done. So yeah, I think PCHC, we can do something similar with, with this kind of, um, you know, come back with, with the next step and then show each other. Uh, I think that's a huge motivating um, device, so to speak, for, for those doing the um, the, the story gathering. Um, thanks. Uh, let me see what uh, Sophie. If you and, and can I just uh, chime something in? What yeah. we do at my dad's um, celebration for life is we had an open mic and people came up to the front and told stories and it was it was really delightful. And now I regret we didn't record that because that could have been another yeah. touch point as well. So. It's making me recognize about how important re recordings are. Yeah. yeah, isn't it ironic that in an age where you can record almost anything, like today, this, this Zoom, it's like how often we don't hit press the record button, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that could actually be the, the title of our uh, of the <laughs> series of, of webinars. It's like, you know, hit the record, you know. <laughs> so, so. Thanks, Gwen, and thanks, Thank uh, Jamie, for sharing. Um, oh, yeah. So our next group is Ada, Richard, and Winnie, Group C. Um, I, can, I took some notes, and I've actually put them into the chat. Uh, there were quite a few um, challenges uh, that people in our group had found. Uh, the first thing is, number one, to prioritize. Like, when there's photos and when there's... <clears throat> a 94 year old father who's there um what are the the most important things to do first like what what do you need to do like use photographs or um that that was one of the questions uh the second thing was the urgency to to retain like to get all that information um you know due to the age of our elders and uh our parents um, the third, third thing, one of the members felt that the challenge was into gathering the, the history, um, techno using technology as one thing, but also to go out there um, to get that information uh, because of distance. Like if they, uh, are the member of our group um, was from Persia, so she wasn't going back to Iran um, and to to uh, to get the information, where and how would she um, learn uh, from others uh, about this? Another item was the issue of a lot of documents, and of these documents, which one would be of value? Which are the important ones to keep? 
so that came up as well as the problem of language. Um, one of the, the group members uh, had, um, has conversational Chinese, but uh, she can't read the language or needs a translator uh, to um, go to a meeting uh, for the interview or to have the information translated. So those were uh, a number of the issues that uh, people um, had problems with in our group. Thanks, Ada. That's, well, I, and, and thanks for uh, that group being so detailed in the, in the practical challenges. And in some sense, I think that's one of the reasons why for today, we, we really wanted to hear about the challenges because it's interesting how many of them are some are insurmountable. So if there's a, a place that people left and they've, you know, they've closed up that society and there's no way you can even get in there, uh, then that's, that's fairly insurmountable. But it's interesting how many um, places if, with the right infrastructure. So I'll give you an example. The, the CCHS, again, the Chinese Canadian, Histor Chinese Canadian Historical Society, you know, we, you know, Pat was on this trip. Um, going to home villages in southern China, you know, we partnered with a, a local university there, and a lot of their students could do research in, you know, village dialect and all that. So they were able to be on the ground collecting some information that may have been basic for them, you know, that's, that's not incredibly difficult if you're there, um, but impossible if you're here uh, for multiple reasons, language, you know, uh, just access, even knowing where to go, who to ask. And so um, one of the things I think that, again, we can crowdsource, we, I hope, through PCHC, having a fairly broad network of, of people, you know, across many different backgrounds, is that, um, is to actually begin to pull together, you know, just ways of starting, finding out, you know, um, are there, uh, again, in that specific practical case of, um, you know, Celia Tan, who's the leading researcher on, in China at Wuyi University on these home villages and home counties for overseas Chinese who came from that region, from Guangdong province. Well, she kind of knows every single village and there's, it's almost like that's the treasure. She, she's familiar with all these villages because she was a lead researcher for the UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, you know, research process. And so, there's sometimes it's like, okay, is there someone who's a key person who, who knows a lot that we can, you know, um, access here in Canada um, or, or in the places? And so I'm glad to hear that and know that. Maybe that's one of the things that we can think about at PCHC as well. And just, uh, okay, how can we even start putting together some of the resources that, um, that are informational access points and things like that? Um, again, Linda, who's also here, who, who's, who's actually a, a specialist on family history research and things like that. She also was on a trip last, last summer, um, or no, last fall, sorry. Um, but thanks for, and thank you for listing all those, because I think in, in some ways it'd be great to go back and, and delve into some of these challenges and see what we can do to help create some um, infrastructure to help uh, make it easier, for instance. Um, uh, I'm talking that there's a couple more groups so um, to hear from uh, Sophie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next group is Wendy's group, Group E. Hey, how are you? So we were having great chat. I don't know that we were very good about um, being very detailed about obstacles, but I do think that we found that there were several pe several of us. We were very interested in capturing the stories. We were um, and have. Language was definitely an issue mm -hmm. for those of us who are third or fourth. I still, I'm sort of a second generation. I speak, but I don't really read well. Mm -hmm. uh, and others are third or fourth generation. Uh, we realized we actually have a lot of connections, you know, and this was, what was interesting we were thinking is, and I think I put it in the chat, is that Bradley pointed out the problem with a lot of funding is that it's regional, you know, and so it's very hard and we actually, should figure out how to work better across the country because there might be a lot of resources or a lot of people doing certain things here in the lower mainland are very good at sharing resources but in ontario quebec you know, the, you know maritimes 
that is not as well developed. You know, Toronto has its own culture. So that's something I was just thinking about. Maybe we can work on within PCHC as we have all these different resources. But so that was it. Sharing, um, and Kira was mentioning. You know, as she's thinking about it, she's coming in from theater arts. Where to start because of the wealth of information that's out there. You know, and um, I think this has been very useful today, just to sort of give examples of where one can start in terms of a particular story. But then I think it'll be really useful if we go ahead and share what we are doing so that we don't, you know, we can leverage each other. And I think a lot of the times we're working in our own little bubbles, you know, and silos, and we don't realize that somebody else has already done something like this. So not to say it's, you know, it's great to have different angles on the same story, but at the same time, it would be so much richer if we knew all this existed and we could put it together. So I think that's something we're thinking about for the future. And, um, um, you know, whether maybe we, it's time to have some sort of directory, you know, or I put in the chat, there are platforms like Slack or other things where you can share, um, you know, somebody can just put, oh, here's this resource and we can um, organize the, con uh, the conversation, you know, to be a little bit more focused, like, oh, here's some resources or here's something about genealogy. Or so um, we're just sort of thinking there's like, we just need a little more structure. Um, yeah. Somebody else jump in because I wasn't very good at taking notes. Winnie <laughs> had jumped from our room halfway through, so. Thanks, Wendy. Any other things someone else wants to add from that group's discussion? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I was in that group, Henry, um, yeah. and Thanks, we, we actually um, spent a lot of time getting to know each other and find out we had all these um, really cool connections yeah. uh, through project work and just, you know, just by, by being, um, I guess, Canadian and Chinese. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I love the fact that you're working with, well, I guess now I can say a lot, lot younger people out in, at UBC and, and building this capacity to tell the stories. Uh, you know, for a person like myself, like I, I look at all the, the, uh, the new technology that's available and how easy and accessible it is. And I, I've totally forgotten about all that. Um, uh, I wanted to just comment in, in one respect around sort of a lot of sort of current affairs and this whole um, issue about funding. There is a lot of um, uh, work right now around anti-racism, which, uh, you know, we, we both talked about um, over the last few weeks. But one of the things that's been popping up a lot in a lot of the, the uh, discussions that I've been having is um, working with uh, the federal government anti-racism directorate. But um, it's popped up a number of times about being able to, to uh, critically think about history and tell other versions of what Canada's history is. And I think, if, you know, as a, maybe a PCHC thing to do, if we talk to government officials about that, um, I'd be happy to arrange sort of a representation yeah. Uh, from out here in, in Toronto to uh, work together that, on that cooperatively, then maybe maybe there's um, uh, a better possibility. Um, the thing about funding for a lot of these projects, and, and we saw this after the uh, the head tax apology and exclusion act apology, that uh, through the uh, the distribution of the uh, the well the the seven or the twelve million dollars available from those those projects, that it was really important for the government bureaucrats to dole it out in a regional way, right? So, I mean, essentially we're telling the same story. The difference is, is perhaps that uh, one family um, started in the lower mainland, but they immigrated across the country. And so, um, you know, we can, if, if, we, if we're willing to cooperate with, the, with each other, which I, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't, then um, maybe we can make a little bit more headway on that. Thanks, Brett. It's interesting, I, you know, it, it, it's a fancy word, infrastructure, but sometimes infrastructure just means, you know, a, you know, a need being met by some funding and some people who are able to do it, but not doing it off the side of their desk for free, but, but just, you know, being compensated enough to be able to do it uh, steadily and in a sustainable way. Uh, that, that, for me, is one of the reasons why we set it up at, at UBC, so that we have continually young students coming through and then they move on. But, you know, some of that capacity, you know, which is easier for some in their 20s, but also some of the capacity, maybe people who have connections already to governmental agencies, it's fairly easy to put together an application because, you know, that's all you do is set together. Um, and so maybe 
cohering some of that together, you know, a bunch of skill sets of, of applying for grants, even having the infrastructure to oversee the financial, you know, a lot of reasons why nonprofits have trouble with grants is just taking care of the money once it comes and reporting and all these kinds of things. And, um, you know, having that experience, uh, once you get funding, you know, how to, how to make sure that you're, you, you, you do all the things you're supposed to do at the right time to report back and things like that. So, um, I'm also mindful that, you know, this goes back again to something that many of you you've raised is, is also what we've found about the short little things that maybe it's just one story is that trying not to do everything all at once, right? So trying to get the whole person's story and I'm not going to share any of it until I've got it right. And I've got the whole life and there's these pieces missing still. Uh, it's like, it's always missing. There's always more, you know, you just keep discovering because the person's life is rich, you know, and especially when you think of how, you know, there's a unknowability and an uncertainty that's never going to go away. Different people know someone differently, literally. They were different people to different people, you know. Um, and, and to kind of go with the poignant, short, very concrete, to look for that essence sometimes that to you, the, the person who's been in conversation with that person, even if it's a conversation with someone who's passed away. Um, and I think that's why also I wanted Christy and Tiffany um, and, and Rose to come in is because, you know, that, that little bit that Christy did with Lily Yang was based on very minimal, you know, they spent a couple hours together. And yet that piece is something that is going to exist and it can inspire others. Um, and, I, and so I think there's that kind of idea also about, um, you know, we can do more as an organization to provide some infrastructure that makes it sustainable and long. But in other ways, it's also about just doing something, even if it's a little small. Um, and I'll give you the story again of Elder Larry Grant. I mean, that little interview in my living room turned into a couple shorts that we posted. Got a lot of attention. A lot of people came to Larry and sort of were talking about how great it was to hear this, you know, his story and share. Um, eventually, that turned into the you know, a trip to China to the father's their father's home village. That turned into a film. So we made sure to make we hit record. In other words, um, you know, I made sure to find five thousand dollars or so so we could send two students with cameras you know, Ali Oshazawa and, um, and Sarah Ling to, to record that trip to their village. Because you only go to your ancestral, your father's ancestral village once for the first time. Because the next time it's your second time. And so if you want to record that moment, you, you better make sure that there's some cameras along the way that can hit record. So I, I, I raise this as sometimes it, it is a slope, you know, a slippery slope towards something bigger. Um, and, to, and if you're working on any project, you know, not to get overwhelmed by what you see as the end goal of capturing it all, you know, and getting every single different aspect. Sometimes that using one letter or using one photo and sort of building something out of it, it's, it's, it's not just a good start. It's, it's a way then within a collective effort and then everybody shares and, you know, we're sitting here getting together every couple of weeks and saying, well, I was really thinking about this one letter or this one photo or this one moment, which, um, and that's, that's enough to share with others to keep you going, to kind of get the feedback and to get the, and to kind of for you as a, if you're the gatherer, to be motivated to keep going too, you know, and to get excited. Because sometimes it's other people sort of getting excited over what you're doing that sort of keeps you going. So uh, some of these are not always, government infrastructure, although I, I, I agree completely with Brad. It's like we, we should be, you know, trying to create a, a supportive infrastructure that goes beyond. Um, sorry, I'm mindful of, of wanting to hear from some others uh, yeah. as well. So our last group is Denise and Kayleen's group. Great. Denise and Kayleen. Denise still here? <laughs> Um, so uh, our group, uh, one of the, uh, like all the other groups kind of have um, all the challenges that we talked about and one of the other things that we talked about was uh, physical items, like how do you preserve because they also tell a lot of stories. 
um, items like clothing, and, uh, uh, other materials, physical items. Um, they sometimes require a lot more um, care, uh, especially like store space. Like, um, what would uh, your suggestion be? Oh, did, did we lose Kayleen? We seem to have lost Kayleen. Um, Can somebody else jump in from that group? Is there someone else in that group? Denise? Oh, Denise? Ben. Um, so another topic that we talked about was talk, just talking about difficult histories um, because one of the participants in the group um, was from a, a resettled refugee family and so just having to bring up some of those topics with their family um, and how to open up those conversations. Um, and then the third thing that we had talked about was just the sheer volume of content like a lot of people have many photos photo albums at home and like physical objects and just how do we even go about like getting started on something that massive and and also things being stored in multiple locations so just accessing and, and finding out like how to bring all these pieces together and build that story <laughs> So there's two, I mean, it's interesting, um, you know, what I was just saying about start, start small. Um, starting small is this huge, uh, if there's one single piece of advice or tips from that, you know, maybe from today is start small. Um, that when you look at a garage full of stuff, you know, there's a reason why, you know, the kids get the moving van and, get, you know, take it to the dump right away. Because if it's a whole garage, it's like, we want that garage for the car. We're gonna finally get it back. There's so many stories of garages full of stuff that as soon as someone passes away before anyone can get in there, it's like, it gets cleared by, you know, the spouse who's been waiting, you know, and resentful for decades of that kind of stuff being collected. And, um, and so part of it is it's tragic when it's, when it all gets, you know, if it gets dumped. But the other is actually, you know, this, if you start small with storytelling, um, it, you know, I just to use that in one example of the, uh, the film that I, you didn't get to see because of the technical problems, like a, my grandfather's butcher's cleaver. You know, it's, it's just one, in a, in a garage full of stuff, it probably would have been on priority list. And this goes to the question that Pat, Priority on the list would have been 1,255 in a garage full of stuff, the butcher's cleaver, right? Um, of course, there's way more important stuff. We lost his head tax certificate, you know. Somehow, when he passed away, it just disappeared. We can't figure out what, how it could have disappeared. And, you know, there's a lot of recriminations and resentment and regret over, you know, what happened, what happened? Um, so, but the butcher's cleaver, it's like, what is that? And yet, you know, you can tell the story around the butcher's cleaver because it's the only thing you got. Sometimes when it's the only thing you got, you end up making do. And so the opposite of having too much stuff is how do you make do with what you have? Um, and in some ways you can fake that by, um, in writer's workshops and things, for those of you who are ever in creative writing workshops, you don't even get a choice, the, the creative writing teacher will like give you something and say write about this and that's a forced discipline in some way so if you want to if you want to do something with say someone else uh, take one thing and don't try to curate them because over curating will may, may send you into paroxysms of, of doubt and and um, just not being able to start uh, like randomly grab an object and then start from that because that's what happens when you lose all the stuff, when someone chucks the garage full of things and there's only one thing left and then you just gotta make do. And it's amazing how creative we can be because all of a sudden things that are the only information available become the thing you have to use and you have to work with. Um, and that often makes for better storytelling, to be honest. Um, I always tell my students, less is more, less is more. The more you can pare it down, 
the better. And so in some sense, the, the garage full of stuff is your problem, it is the challenge. And the way out of it is to actually to go the opposite way. Start with something small, start storytelling around small things, single things, things that aren't number one on the priority list. And so again, one of the things that we have difficulty with is to give priority, which is the most important object to save. Um, the most interest as a historian, I'll just say, one of the most interesting things as a historian and archaeologist too, Denise was a ar trained archaeologist, is you don't get to choose. The thing that comes to you from the depths of time is the thing that made it that didn't get destroyed. And so that's all you have. And so you just make do. And so part of being a professional historian is just making do with what you've got and what can you do with this thing that survived to, you know, arrive on your, um, your desk, so to speak, or that you dug out of the ground. It's the only thing you've got. So now you got to make do. Um, in a strange way, family history is the hardest when you have too many things is you're, you're gonna be overwhelmed with the garage full. So start with that thing, the photo, the this, the, the certificate, what, whatever it is, the, the cleaver. Um, and, that, and that's important, and I'll put it in a different way. It's most important for migrant histories because what, what you carry, the belongings that you carried often are self-curated. Right. It was the portable thing that could be taken. It was the thing when you had, so the story constantly I, I, I often use is, again, when Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians were removed, they were allowed one suitcase full of stuff. What did they carry in that suitcase? So, or, or another example is, if, you know, many Filipina, you know, um, domestics, they, they got to go away for two years. And they're, what are they going to carry in the suitcase? you know, with them as they go abroad to Canada or Kuwait or, you know, Hong Kong or Singapore or whatever. What, what's in that suitcase? Um, what is the thing that you carry? What is the thing that you saved? What is the thing you made sure that you brought from the Ukraine, you know, from the, you know, from wherever? Um, and so my, migration is an interesting um, filter as well that you may not be able to get back to that place because a person was a refugee from there. Um, but in that sense, did they, were they able to take anything? You know, we're, and maybe, um, I, I remember a long time ago, I, had a, I did an interview with someone who uh, literally, it was such a painful experience. They were, they were uh, in their 20s, they were a university student when, the, when you know, uh, Japanese American removal uh, occurred and he became a sociologist precisely so he could distance himself you know from these painful events and painful uh, traumatic things that he had witnessed um, and, and but it was interesting you could even for him he could read through his own lines so to speak he, he was aware that there are certain things that had meaning precisely because they mirrored that detachment that he had acquired. So it wasn't that, so the objects, in other words, for the storytelling wasn't that painful thing. It was this other thing that reflected that lifelong work that he had done to actually detach himself from, from the trauma and the, the pain of it. And so that object that framed in a storytelling about trauma and a desire on his part to remove himself from it and distance himself and detach himself from it. That object said more about his life than something that maybe was, was on point in terms of, of trauma and, and pain. Um, so I give you that example just as a, um, you know, what's that thing that captures the essence? Um, and that, and it, we're interpreting someone's life and they're interpreting their own life. So, so it is metaphor, it is analogy, it is, you know, the thing that stands for the greater whole. Um, again, the, the butcher's cleaver. I, uh, my grandfather was, a, he was number two cook on the Princess Patricia on the Alaskan cruise ship lines. I mean, that cleaver is a, a kind of, you know, a part of a bigger story.
Um, I'm, I'm very mindful that actually we've gone, you know, past, <laughs> blown past the uh, two hour and uh, gone into the, into the half hour that was also uh, meant to be, um, meant to be, some, you know, we, we asked, I asked Sophie, it's like if uh, we have, um, with PCHC, I, I, this has been so valuable uh, to kind of get a sense of what PCHC could do. I mean, the, there's enough board directors here Hopefully that the next time we meet and say, hey, you know, we heard a lot about what what we can do maybe to organize some regular gatherings so that it's not a one off workshop, but maybe it is a kind of, hey, let's let's have these regular get togethers to, to kind of prop each other up to, to create a, a sense of momentum. Um, there's an idea also of, of having something online in the fall that that people again as an endpoint. So if you do do that short clip. You know, it's not the be all end all, it's not the end of the process, but maybe having enough excuse to say, hey, post it up, you know. And so my eight year old sort of like family special belonging thing is, is we're gonna post it up and, and start to share um, and primarily I think with each other, just so that it kind of helps inspire each other to kind of do it and finish something and not wait for it to be perfect and comprehensive, but to just start with, with it and get the process going and to keep going down that path. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe that's, uh, maybe we can actually delay a little bit about the, how to upload, how to put it into different formats for actually a, a workshop devoted to that and maybe getting people to put together the thing, the small thing, you know, um, to push you to, to, to pick one thing to work on. Um, I'm again also mindful that uh, you know we're all busy, we're all isolated with COVID. But strangely enough, uh, if there's one thing I've learned, UBC moved all 50,000 students in the one week period online. We had all these classes. If you if you'd said, hey, can we move all our classes online? Like it would have taken. We would have said two year minimum transition, and, and even then, half the people would have fought you until until retirement. Instead, COVID-19, we just went one week, everybody's online and now we're all online. And so one of the strange silver lining bits is that um, we can actually pull people together across the country. I mean, Brad's, Brad's absolutely right. If we needed to wait until we get air flights and everything like that and get together in the same place to have a meeting, we never would have had that meeting. But strangely enough, Zoom can bring us from Maritimes all the way across to here. And so um, I, I think maybe, you know, that's what this experiment was too. Can we, can we do something where, and maybe we structured around what we did in the small groups, um, you know, thinking about how that sharing with five people, you know, is, is actually quite uh, generative, just hearing the conversations you had in your small groups and maybe we'll restructure it. So there's less talking from someone like me. Um, in fact, maybe virtually none um, and more sort of sharing with each other peer to peer, so to speak, and then sharing with a larger group as, as needed and, and maybe showing off things that you do as another way of, you know, getting you to do it. And then the, all the rest of us, so to speak, just giving some feedback and liking this or liking that. And um, uh, so, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's maybe one of the things that I'd say is my lesson from this is, there's a, you know, been great to actually hear from all of you about why you're doing you know what you want to do what are, what's in your way language um, just going to that we have in our networks some language capability and so maybe again going back to Brad's point what what should we pay for and uh, and validate as important and crucial we sometimes don't respect enough perhaps that, that that ability to kind of translate and help someone else you know read something in a, a letter or something in another language so that they can understand better um, what's in there and why maybe that's something we can bring to the table too to really help out you know those of those of you who could really use that yeah wendy hey um I was thinking we either Winnie or Stephanie might give a little hint about a project. So this 
yeah. activity I sort of mentioned in our chat room. This um, webinar, Henry um, has done, it's sort of a lead in to a campaign that we're going to roll out in the fall. And he hinted at it because um, we were amongst our board meetings thinking about how can we do some activities if we're going to be locked in and we can't do things in, in, in person. And we know that PCHC has a good history of storytelling in different formats and uh, a lot of digital. So we were hoping to encourage people to do their stories and Pat and Ada have been very good. They've actually put together some of their own little stories and we were going to showcase Henry's daughters in um, starting in the fall. And, and, and we would love to encourage people to show, uh, to share their videos. Uh, I think, may I say the, 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 the hashtag? The hashtag that we're thinking of is Faces of Pacific Canada and PCHCMOM. Um, and I think we were thinking over the summer, we actually had talked this yesterday, or yesterday about doing a follow-up where we could do Q&A or workshop together July 24th probably around the same time. So we can give details on that. And then, so this today is validating that we need to have these follow-ups and these conversations. Uh, we can think a little bit about how to structure it, but at least that was already in our heads on our calendar. Uh, and then we have an incentive. If you put together a story, we will give you an audience um, starting out, you know, August, September, October, and then we can have this continue on and we'll figure out about archiving. But um, you, yes, we can make history together. So that would be lovely. Thank you. Um, yes, I think the date that we kind of were looking at is July the 5th, July the 25th, which is a Saturday. For the right. fourth okay. of shopping. Is that correct? Others can. It was, let me look at it. It's uh, July. Yes, you're right. July 25th. Saturday. And we can post that in a newsletter. I mean, do we want to make it just the people who've shown up at this conference or just still let people in um, who didn't necessarily participate in this webinar? I mean, I'm, I'm letting people know and I'm asking the people here, do you think it's best just to work with the people that we've been in or do we just open it up and say, hey, we've had this conversation and we're going to continue this conversation. So inclusive yes i agree okay <laughs> but i just you know people felt like oh this is a little awkward if it's halfway through but i, I think okay well that's that's useful and is i think a month, month is a great amount of time too um yeah if, if if people are really interested in this i think um you know maybe we can think of ways to put some pointers and stuff like that up to help you you know, with resources that are just available to you, you know, so YouTube, there's tons of great videos on how to do this or that little thing with this app and that app. So maybe we can throw some of that. Up. Art creating, yeah. But also to lower that bar, you know, show up in a month, kind of like, you know, it's like going, going for the run in the morning with your friends. It's like lower the bar to all you have to do is like show up with- Show them, up, you know. a little something, show raw up, footage. Showing up is, is half the battle kind of thing and um, not sort of saying you got to come in with the, the, the best, you know, five minute clip in, ever made of, of, of it's, you know, um, it's a first gathering after this if, if you want to have a gathering. Let's, um, you know, maybe, maybe show up with that, uh, that thing, the photo. And having dug enough around it that you can talk a little bit about it for I don't know, five minutes to everyone else here. Just like, you got five minutes, bring your show and tell, and you know, and what do you want to do with it? You know, um, like when Gwen was talking about your father's, uh, you know, funny stories, okay. Yeah, maybe what it is is, you know, one, you know, or and what you'd like to do with it. So it's, it's a pitch to yourself and to everyone else. Um, it's interesting. Tiffany may not be around anymore, but one of the, th you know, this summer class, we were supposed to go to Penang and Singapore and Hong Kong and Southern China and eat. And, you know, it was, it was this whole trip around eating our way across and, you know, a 10 meter diet when you were in the villages, like every, 
everything with within 10 meters. You see a chicken mm -hmm. and on your plate, you know, two hours later, um, all the vegetables were freshly. And then it turned into a Zoom class like this one, right, where we didn't get to go anywhere. Um, but one of the things that the students were great at doing was using the internet to go explore the whole world of what are the best ways to present things online and, you know, what did they find as the favorite experiences online? You know, what moved them online? Uh, that's why when Christy and Tiffany and Rose were talking about subtle Asian traits and how you had 1.4 million people, most of them, their, their kind of age and around talking about what it meant to be Asian you know, and telling their grandparents' story telling this or that on Facebook. Um, the great thing about that was the end project was not a finished project. They did an analysis of what was, they thought was great out there that worked, you know, storytelling, what's the best way to do this or that. But their actual final project was to come back and say what they'd like to do, a pitch on, you know, a project that they hadn't done yet. It was, it came out of what they learned and so just to lower that bar to make it easy to show up in a month is to come in with maybe an object or a photo or something but what you'd like to do with it and, and not even to already you've done it and so what you're sharing with the rest of us is uh, is a desire to kind of a proposal to the rest of us and to yourself uh, um, I think that actually is in some sense, because then you'll think through all the things that you possibly could do. Um, and you won't have eliminated all of the possibilities. You're just trying to scope it down to, to, you know, I'd love to do this. And I also thought about doing this. And I also thought about this way, but it's, it's, it's um, so how's that sound as an assignment, so to speak, you know, don't come in with the finished product, come in with the, the dragon's den pitch and, and no one will yell at you and say you're stupid so, you know this is not the dragon's den in that way but it's it's to bring something back to the group and to share that and then and maybe um people can give some feedback and advice and just just simply hearing man i'd love to see that yeah. oh, that sounds so interesting yeah. you know, or i was thinking something very similar uh, th that's the kind of thing that i think is maybe yeah. we can do as a group that you just can't do by yeah. yourself, you know, in your in your study or in your office. Um, you know, let's let's try not to do this as lone lone researchers and storytellers or story gatherers. That sounds great. And um, I posted on the chat. If you look at the, the current ACAM three hundred and fifty on the YouTube, um, the the students film the their short films. Because they've just done a semester of doing this with Al Yoshizawa. Yeah. And um, those shows, their little products are going to be up until June 30th. And you'll see it's quite varied. And their take is completely all over the board. And, you know, some are a little more persuasive than others. But, but that's the whole point, right? And so if you see that, then you're not going to feel like, oh, everything has to be perfect. Because we've had very good examples today. Um, but it's actually, yeah, it's quite, it, it can be quite varied and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So that's why I thought if you want to look at that, it'll encourage you. It doesn't, ha I mean, they worked the whole semester and I'm sure a lot of it was last minute and some of it you'll say, but it's still moving. All of it is still moving. So I think if you just look at that, then you'll say, it's okay. You know, I can come with something. All right. We'll post, we'll post things. Thanks, Wendy, for that. It's like, that's, that's, that's some student short film that I think you'll enjoy. That's Al's class. And, you know, um, and I, what is, I'll post, uh, I know. And they had to do it mostly post COVID. So it's perfect, right? They just had to work with whatever they had. They couldn't go out to interview, so. Yeah, and we'll post also, so Tiffany and Christy, the class they just completed actually was just the pitches. And so we'll put that up too. It was a Zoom, a link to that where you can see what they, but, but again, it's, it's just to kind of inspire all of you to come back with whatever you've got, you know, whatever you have in hand. Um, you know, what you could carry, just to go back to that, whatever it is you yeah. could carry virtually to us, you know, to share. That's good. Um, Winnie, uh, Sophie, uh, uh, thank you. You want to add? I mean, we've, we've now, we now expect you to, uh, to be the person who's really going to help us next time on, on how to post and everything like that. But uh, yeah. Sophie's done a wonderful job putting together the beta you know, mock up for what's 
what's coming in the fall, but uh, maybe she can even share a little bit. Again, it's not done, but maybe you can share and get some feedback on how that might work. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was thinking that um, since we're kind of over time, I'll probably send out a follow-up document just um, with all our chats and like with links to all the different videos and just showing like Pat's video and then once Ada's is completed, then also Ada's. So just so you can get an idea of what, how you might want to do it or, and then in the follow-up ones when we talk about how to actually like post them and everything or to like send them to me. So I, I can definitely follow up with everyone on that. Thank you. So. Winnie, any, uh, anything you want to? Yeah, nothing to add. It's been great. Thank you, Henry and the whole team and all the participants from coast to coast. Um, we should give um, Sophie a little break. I don't expect her to work on the weekend. So early next week, she and I will put our heads together and we'll follow up with an email to everyone so that you can access the material we've prepared. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sophie, for uh, she was manning the back or whatever that term is when you <laughs> were taking staffing, staffing. staffing yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the word. Yeah, the, the verb is she was I doing mean, the work behind the scenes to make sure you got into your breakout rooms and <laughs> got back from them and all that kind of stuff. So thanks to Sophie for taking care of the technical back end, let's call it. Um, but also, I know that some of you are like uh, we I didn't mention that. Uh, that many, uh, Denise was co-curating this uh, seat at the table, but I think we also had Imogene Lim here on, you know, with us. And Imogene is one of the um, people who've been involved in the Chinese Canadian Museum, the Provincial Chinese Canadian Museum, uh, a lot of the work. Uh, the, uh, she was on that working group, Winnie was on that working group. Um, I believe, uh, I'm trying to think if anyone else here was. Um, but, uh, so there's all these kind of exciting, interesting things going on which again are, are places where if you do something, you know, PCH, whether it's PCHC, which is broader or specific to the Chinese Canadian industry or, uh, Jan, you know, I think uh, Mike is also doing some posting of storytelling. So there's lots of, uh, the great thing right now is that the number of outlets now, you know, for, um, I know that BVM has, uh, Denise was the curator for uh, a co-curator for across the Pacific about Chinese Canadians in Burnaby, but also right now BVM is working on the history of South Asian um, communities in Burnaby and so Richmond is working on, so there's a lot of our local as well as I think across the country, um, there's outlets for, if you do, if you even start small, there's, there's lots of now I think, outlets and just things online. To, to be part of broader communities too, sharing things. And so we'll build something through PCHC. I, I think what's exciting about today is we're a lot of energy here and um, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to personally see, see us keep getting together. Um, but I wanna thank all of you for, for taking the time. Um, we're not gonna, okay. So one of the reasons why we had this extra, we, had, we, we didn't, you say it was gonna end at four and then we didn't, and we haven't even ended at 4.30. Is one of the weird things about Zoom meetings for the last two months is if you're at a face-to-face -face event, someone's talking or there's a panel and then it ends and everybody hangs out and, you know, sort of like, you got to start stacking the chairs to get people to leave. And I think that's one of the nice things about those is the sociality afterwards. And so um, with Zoom, you know, sign out anytime, but we're not, we're not going to kick you off the virtual. So if, you, if anybody wants to just, you know, keep hanging out for a little bit, um, you know, to talk to someone else on who's, who's on here, uh, feel free. We're, we're not going to end the Zoom. Um, we'll end the recording. How's that? So, so we'll formally <laughs> say thank you for all taking part in this. And I hope you got something out of it. Um, I hope also that, you know, that the small breakout rooms uh, work well to, to, talk, to have a little bit of a smaller conversation. I, I know some of you probably that conversation was cut off. So that's part of also maybe leaving us on right now if anybody wants to to kind of continue to talk about something. But otherwise, those, thank you so much for, you know, taking your Saturday to be a part of this. And, you know, it's been really interesting for me. Thank you. Thanks.